Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. From the City of Angels, near the Pacific Ocean, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. In a moment, one of the world's greatest ufologists joins us, Richard Dolan, next on Coast to Coast AM. Hi, George. That's, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. What got you interested in ufology, Richard? Oh, golly. I've uh, always been interested in uh, history, and I fell into UFO history. I guess that's really how it was. I was about 30 years ago, working on a doctoral dissertation in Cold War studies, uh, basically the Harry Truman presidency and everything to do with uh, the birth of the CIA and um, the early early Cold War. And I remember being in a bookstore, and I <laughs> saw a copy of a very great UFO book called Above Top Secret, and it was a subtitle that got my attention, the worldwide UFO cover-up, and that, of course, was by the great Timothy Good. And it was right on a display, and I thought, wow, worldwide UFO cover-up. This is early 1990s. And, you know, even in the 90s, I mean, many of us had heard of UFO claims. I just didn't know much about them. And I remembered flipping through that book thinking, I, I recognize a lot of the people he had written about, except in a very non-UFO context. I was reading about them in my academic research. And I, I guess I could say I was intrigued. And I guess the, the real question that I, that I kept thinking of, or the thing I didn't like, I should put it this way, I didn't like having a big unknown hanging over uh, an area that I was studying. That is right. the late 1940s, early 50s. And here's a claim that these guys that I was studying, um, here's a, a book that was saying they were really interested in UFOs. And I thought, why have I never read about this in any of my academic book uh, research. And so I thought, uh, I'll buy the book. Let's look into it. And I really honestly only expected to spend uh, a couple of months researching this subject. I thought, I'm just going to get into it. I'm going to figure out what I think about it, and then I'm going to get out. And that was my fatal mistake because huh. it's such a fascinating subject. You can't get out. Grand. You're too good for us. Not, it, it is. That's exactly it. There is lots going on lately, Richard, in the field of ufology. I want to talk to you about a lot of them. But one story, very strange story, puzzling story, but could be a fantastic story, is a former intelligence official, former United States Air Force officer, David Grush. What do you think of that story? Well, I think it's a fascinating story and deservedly probably the biggest story in the UFO community this year, I think. Uh, Grush, yeah, as you say, he's a former intelligence official. He's a decorated combat officer. And the thing about him is that he, he was explicitly described as a whistleblower. That's a phrase that gets, I think, it tends to get overused. But I don't think it's overused in his case. Uh, this is a guy who has had very, very high uh, security clearances from what we are told. And he, uh, in fact, had worked with the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO. It's very, uh, you know, very interesting. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency as well. And he was part of the UAP task force for two years from 2019 to 2021. And so he was in a very good position to, to say the things he did. And, and what he said is that the... U.S. government, uh, U.S. government allies, uh, defense contractors also, that they have recovered partial fragments and uh, intact vehicles of non-human origin and have been doing this for decades. So that's the ultimate crash retrieval bombshell statement that I think many of us have been waiting for for a long time. And he's coming out and he just makes makes this statement. Uh do you think he's? More, do you think he's so legit? Well, I, I do. I think that there's a lot of argument going about him back and forth. Uh, 
uh, I mean, I have been aware that, uh, I mean, there's claims of people saying, well, I don't trust him. He's another government guy. Uh, is he going to show us the goods? We haven't seen any documentation. He hasn't really, all he's doing is repeating stories. And, and that is true. But I'm, I'm uh, drawn to what uh, journalist Ross Coltart said about Grush. Uh, Ross, of course, interviewed him at great length. And uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think he, he used the phrase that he said there's a conga line of individuals ready to support David Grush. In other words, a lot of very high-level, important people who uh, speak on his behalf. I've spoken to a few folks myself who are very, very supportive of him. And I just haven't seen anything that is the ultimate red flag for me. It seems to me that he, um, he's he got the right background. He's He's saying the right things. He's not giving the world the kind of proof that the world would want. But it is my understanding that he has said some of these things in um, in camera or in, in, um, in confidence to uh, members of Congress. And so I think, you know, where we're at is we want to take it from here and see where this develops. But I think so far he looks legit to me, yes. One of the strange stories he talks about is that Italy's Benito Mussolini during World War II, that Italy picked up a non-human spacecraft in 44 yeah. or 45, and the Vatican knows yeah. about it. And we assisted. What do we know about that? It is very interesting. You know, there has been research over the last uh, decade or more out of Italy um, from their senior researcher, Roberto Pinotti, who I know has been investigating uh, this very scenario. At least I think it's the same one. Um, it's got to be. Uh, I would think so. And and in that case, although in, in Pinotti, uh, I thought the case was from the 1930s. So, you know, I don't know if there's a discrepancy there or not, but this is something that uh, when I first heard about an alleged Italian UFO crash, I I thought, well, I don't I don't really know how much credence to put into this. But uh, I do believe that a lot of the, the work uh, from the Italian ufologists about that does seem to have some uh, credibility to it. So I'm wondering if that is what Grush is referring to. The real question I have about that is where did he actually get that that data point, that bit of information? Did this come from one of his uh, high-level intelligence source, or are they just pulling this from the UFO research community? And I would love to know the answer to that. What's going on with Congress? Anything going on there? Uh, you know, my finger's not 100% on that pulse. Uh, I have, I've chatted with a few folks who are following this, and, I mean, there are— there are people who believe that congressional hearings are absolutely going to happen this month. Uh, there is an interest in some members of Congress about this subject. I mean, it's very, very interesting that we have this state of affairs now. You know, a couple of years ago, you, I don't think you could have bribed a member of Congress enough to get them to be interested right. publicly to talk about this. But that's not the case now. And there is, uh, you know, particularly since Grush has come out, I think that's revitalized uh, some members of Congress to look into this. There has been talk of a hearing. Whether or not it's going to happen is really the question. Um, I mean, <laughs> I think it would be a good thing if we had genuine congressional hearings on UAP. I would like to see that. I think a lot of folks following this field would like to see that. Uh, part of me has the attitude of I'll believe it when I see it, to be perfectly honest with you, George, because I just I, – I always feel like the United States uh, government has a great ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory when it comes to getting to the truth of UFOs. And uh, I, I don't want them to continue that track record, but we'll just have to see. I would like to see hearings happen, and if they do, this is a really interesting element of – the whole disclosure scenario, you know, 13 years ago, I co-authored a book, A.D. After Disclosure, and we, my co-author, Bryce Abel, and I tried to puzzle out, like, hey, how could disclosure happen? And then if it did happen, what would, what would happen next? What would the results be right. in our world? And uh, the one thing that I always assumed back then, this is back in 2010, was that there would be a, a really potential avalanche effect. So like one big truth comes out and that 
just causes a whole cascade of other truth tellers to come out to tell their story. And then the next thing you know, the narrative is out of control and it's we're in crazy town and all the, all the stuff's coming out. And that was, that was a scenario that I really thought was potentially could happen. And in the last five, six years, that is not what we have seen happen. We had the, the big stories coming out of the New York Times back in 2017, and that was very interesting. But it really kind of just went in slow motion after that, and we're still in this very slow motion, this drip, drip of disclosure, as it were. But it seems to so be where, coming out of all these different sides, doesn't it? Say that again, George. It I'm sorry. Se- it seems to be coming from all these different angles and sides. Yeah, well, that's a good way to look at it. You've got you've got members of Congress. They have an interest. You've got um, – you had this little coalition. Let's call them TTSA. That's the – they were a group that was kind of pushing this forward. And now what we're seeing are other government uh, insiders stepping forward. And if, if it really is coming from a lot of different sources like this and if it continues to – I might take that as a good sign, as a positive sign that the the momentum is, in fact, uh, picking up, and maybe we will we will get to a tipping point. Richard, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Do you have a preference? Well, I think I prefer the UFO. To be honest, with you. <laughs> me too. But we can. I, I'll roll with wherever we go. I mean, I I use UAP as well. Uh, it's. If it, if it works, it works, and uh, that's really the only thing that matters to me. Isn't it intriguing that we seem to be getting more and more publicity about these objects than we have in recent years? Yes, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I think many, we wonder why all the time. I've been wondering this as well. And I honestly think a big part of it is uh, – I mean, I actually see this as a natural development in our society at this time. We have uh, an interconnectivity that did not exist more than 30, you know, 35 years ago. That's right. And I think it has just been, a, it took a little bit of time for the momentum to develop. In the pre internet era, I think it was a lot easier, frankly, for information about this subject to be corralled into narrow places and not not be the subject to a widespread public dis, uh, discussion. And I think what we saw during the 1990s, and especially the first decade of this century, was an explosion in, in uh, discussions about UFOs. Even though the major establishment didn't really seem to pay attention to it, this was a conversation that was growing exponentially during those years, I think. And I think what that led to was a, a much greater groundswell uh, public interest and public, uh, a lot of public opinions on on this matter of UFO or UAP, and uh, I wondered for a long time, you know, when it would result in a kind of breakthrough. Some group, maybe a group of individuals, uh, thinking back to TTSA when they were active. Uh, I do think that they kickstarted a lot of this, and but I, I put that down as a relationship to. Uh, the broader cultural movement of, of in, a stronger interest in UFO. You know, those uh, people who were active in this field in the 1990s and the early 2000s, I think they had a lot to do with this. And uh, I think they prepared prepared the road, as it were, prepared the field for what we're now seeing. But th- I, d- I do think we're, we're looking at a kind of factional battle. I don't think that we're looking at it, some kind of unified disclosure movement coming from within the government. I do think that we have groups of people who are opposed to each other in uh, the outcome of this. So, you know, 70 plus years ago, Donald Kehoe, writing his UFO books, talked about the secrecy group. And I and, and at the same time, he talked about factions within the military, within the intelligence community, who prom- who wanted to see an end to UFO secrecy. There were factions 70 years ago, and I think we're still seeing that play out today. But we're in a a little bit of a better position in terms of where the public is at, uh, our ability to share information. Uh, All of these are better than they were, I think, in the 1950s and 60s. So we're we're looking at a really very interesting drama play out right, right before our eyes. 
Richard, an area that doesn't seem to be as prevalent as years ago is the area of abductions. I mean, we had the late Bud Hopkins, John Mack. We had experts dealing with abduction cases. I'm not hearing many of those anymore. No, you're you're speaking to something that really is uh, means a lot to me. Uh, I think that in our current state of this conversation that we're having about UAP or UFOs, there are a lot of things that are missing, and and abductions is one of these missing pieces. And you're totally right. Um, you know, I think back even in the even among UFO uh, conferences and UFO researchers prior to 2017, prior to the kind of shift in our public discussion. Uh, I really feel that abductions were a much bigger part of the conversation. The Barney and Betty Hill story was huge in those days, remember? For years, for years, people actually, absolutely, and not just in the 20th century, but right on into the 21st, as well as other abduction accounts, and there's many of them. And I do think it's true we're not getting a whole lot of conversation about it, Um you know, and the abduction researchers that are out there, you mentioned Bud Hopkins. He's gone. Dave Jacobs is retired. John Mack's gone. Uh, there's Yvonne Smith, who I think the world of, but there's not many other active abduction researchers still really actively uh, bringing in new people and publishing. There's a few, but it's it's not, not that much. I think there's a real need uh, and a lack of, of fresh abduction research and published abduction research, because I know it's still going on. Uh, I still talk with many individuals who have had abduction experiences, uh, whether in the past or recently. I know it's out there. So I think we just, uh, we're not, we're not hearing it. And I mean, look, you think about the, the whole UAP conversation we're having, and we're at this point of, you still have people saying, well, is it the Russians? Is it the Chinese? Uh, and, and, you know, this whole attitude as if the entire UFO phenomenon, the UAP phenomenon, started with the Tic Tac in 2004. And I'm just thinking, hey, does anyone remember the 20th century? <laughs> we had a huge, exactly. There was a huge UFO phenomenon going on every decade. And you just don't hear anything about it. What was so the name doctor, of the young man who was, who was driving a flying a Cessna and, and he disappeared? Well, you, there's Frederick Valentich, if you that's him. him from, that's him. Yeah, from Australia in the 1978. And, um, yeah, all that history is gone. So abductions are missing in the conversation. And really, frankly, most of the history of the UFO subject is just gone missing. It's not, it's not coming up. And I think that's a really dangerous place to be, and it's a great mistake. We need to understand the history of this subject. It didn't just start with the Tic Tac UFO in 2004. There's a lot going on and a lot of U.S. government culpability in hiding this information for generations and indeed really for more than a human lifetime now. You're working on a book that is one of my special areas of expertise in terms of interest, Unidentified Submersible Objects, USOs. Yes. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm absolutely just in love with this project. And I did a I did a thing on a couple of USO cases. And I've always been interested in it as well. I think it's hard not to be when you really think about I mean an object going into a big body of water, coming out of a body of water, that's incredible. And so I started that and then I I just uh it was popular and I thought I love going into this. So I, I just dove in and uh, tried to access all of the sources of really good USO cases that I was able to. And I really wanted to get a sense of the long history of this, like how far back do good reports go and all of that. So I've just been uh, diving into it. Uh, what I have now is a, already a pretty long book but uh, I have to say, I've got a little bit more that I need to do. I'm hoping to have this done this year, and um, we'll see what happens. I want to get it illustrated. We'll and Definitely it come nice on things. back by the time that's done. But share with us a good USO story. Oh, golly. Well, there's uh, quite a few. I'll share you one from, how about from 1825? 1825. So- uh, it's, the, it's one of the earliest great 
uh, USO stories that I came across. And it took place in the Pacific Ocean, uh, not far from Hawaii. And uh, one, one of the reasons I like it is that we have an exact date for it. It's uh, August 12th, 1825. And we know about this from the diary of one of the guys on the ship. It was a British ship. Uh, the British Navy, of course, dominated the world's oceans at that particular time. And this man was a naturalist on the ship named Andrew Bloxham. And what he wrote in his journal, let me pull it up right here. He said about half past three o'clock this morning, so 3.30 in the morning. So you're in a British ship, sails. There's no, you know, no motors, nothing like that. They're just sailing by the wind. It's very dark. 3.30 in the morning, surrounded by ocean. He said, three, half past three, the middle watch on deck was astonished to find everything around them suddenly illuminated. And he said, turning their eyes eastward, they beheld a large, round, luminous body rising up about seven degrees, apparently from the water to the clouds. This is all his wow. writing. And then, falling again out of sight... So it rises up and then drops. And then he says, and a second time rising and falling. He said it was the color of a red hot cannon shot and appeared about the size of the sun. He said it gave so great a light that a pin might be picked up on deck. That's out of his diary from 1825. And uh, it's one of those uh, cases, I mean, this is in the days before we had MUFON investigators going out there saying, <laughs> if you if you held a pin at the if you held a dime at the arm's length, how big would how it big be? would it they, be? They, <laughs> they weren't doing any of that. Uh, we just have this this one statement, but it's a heck of a statement. I mean, let's face it. And what I like about it is that he's he was a naturalist. He wasn't trying to look for any uh, unusual types of explanations. He was obviously baffled by it and, and simply recorded it. But there are some really great ones. I was just looking at one from um, British Columbia. This is from the early 1980s. I wonder if I can dig it up, but I can just recite it, I think, from memory. And we've had a lot of Navy sightings, too, haven't we, where sailors oh. will see these things underwater, and they're not submarines. No, absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. And and a number of them are associated with uh, major U.S. aircraft carriers. Uh, one of the main ones that seems to be just uh, was plagued by UFO and USO sightings was the USS Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, that, was a, that was the first nuclear-powered um, aircraft carrier. And there are just a variety of stories concerning the FDR with these uh, these objects. And, you know, the thing about them is you get stories from Navy guys. They've all retired. This is all after their career is over. And it's 20 years. It's 30 years later. And then they they tell you their story, you know. And so you can't – this is not from freedom of information. You don't have a lot of government corroboration for it, but you've got a heck of a story from a naval officer or a naval seaman who has something just fascinating to say. And uh, there's there's quite a few of them. There's quite a few of them. This one of uh, the FDR that I'm thinking of ha happened back in 1954, I think the early part of 1954 when it was on its way back to being refit in um, in Seattle. It was coming and it was commissioned in 1945, by the way. Yes, that's that's right. And um, the FDR was also part of what was called Operation Main Brace in 1952. That was a series of NATO exercises in the North Sea, where, and they, that whole uh, group, experienced uh, days of UFO sightings, so objects over them. Uh, the FDR was part of that, and two years later, it experiences an object apparently that came right out of the water and shut down uh, all of the communication systems on the ship for um, for a good half hour. Uh, from what this one uh, Navy Navy officer said many years after the fact, uh, they were just kind of blown away by it. Uh, there are people freaking out on the deck. 
one guy screaming, it's God, it's the end of the world. <laughs> and what they saw was a, a huge glowing orange uh, sphere. Not that different than the 1825 case I was just mentioning earlier. Uh, this is a large spherical thing that um, apparently they encountered and just uh, – and uh, actually, no, I'm getting my stories mixed up. That was the U.S. of John F. Kennedy. With the FDR, they, they had the long star-shaped object. I'm so sorry. That uh, came over the ship, then shot away, then came back down. A couple of objects came out of the water, joined the cigar-shaped object. And then that went into the water. I got mixed up. The glowing object was from 1971, USS John F. Kennedy in the Caribbean. So forgive me. So there's a lot of these aircraft carrier cases that are out there. And they all come from these retired uh, naval officers or, or Navy, Navy professionals. And none has been hostile, Richard. None. No, they haven't been hostile, they've, but they've shut down the systems of the ship. I mean, you think about being on an aircraft carrier. You've got 4,000, 5,000 people on there, and this object is hovering right over you, and you cannot communicate with any other vessel for 30 minutes or even an hour in one case. Uh, it's not hostile necessarily, but if you're a military professional, you might consider that a hostile act if they're disabling I mean, my goodness, a U.S. nuclear aircraft carrier uh, yeah, could be absolutely. considered a very provocative thing. But you're, it's true, no overt attacks uh, that I've, I've come across, but uh, a heck of a lot of interest and powerful capability. Let's go to the phones. Let's start by going east of the Rockies, Alex in Boston, Mass. Hey, Alex, welcome. Hey, how you doing? Great. Go ahead, buddy. So uh, there's a 1562 AD woodcut um, that shows uh, an, a scene, uh, a woodcut um, uh, carving that was printed out. And uh, it, 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 this was over Nur Nuremberg, Germany. And I'm just kind of asking uh, if people have considered the, the history and the different types of, um, uh, you know, evidence that, we have already that that shows these um, UFOs that that are out there. It's it's pretty interesting because you know they've got this cigar shape, these red balls, and even you know more mysterious is this black spear uh, looking element uh, in 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 the in the woodcut. Well, we're talking about ancient artifacts, and Alex is absolutely right, Richard. They're out there, and they're all over the place. Yeah, it's interesting. The Nuremberg woodcut has gotten a, a great amount of attention, and uh, I'm just going to say I, I don't discount it, but I do think that one thing we, we want to do when we look at these ancient stories is try to understand the history of the region uh, around them. And I'll just point out in the case of Nuremberg, Germany, uh, the 1560s, you're talking about uh, the beginning of massive uh, religious discord going on throughout Europe and particularly in Germany and particularly in that region of Germany. There's a lot of fighting already happening. And the, the question is, is the activity monitoring the fighting or what you do get with a lot of these cases are ancient writers who were looking for portents and signs in the sky. This is a very, very common thing. Um, and it's very difficult for me when I look back just to see, is this is actually, is this legitimate? And I'm just going to be very, very uh, blunt about it. And the Nuremberg case is one that I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it is. So I hate to say that because I know we have a lot of uh, people wanting to support it. Uh, having said that, I do think that there are a number of very good ancient sightings that are well worth our consideration. Uh, where there doesn't appear to be any other kind of outside motivation um, and where there really is, it's a puzzle. The Nuremberg one, I don't know if we're ever really going to get to the bottom of that one, but I just will point out it was in the middle of a, a very, very um, powerful civil uh, religious war that was going on where, again, you do find motivations for uh, by riders to look for signs in the sky, to interpret them. Um, 
in terms of one side or another of a religious or social conflict. So it's it's a tricky one for me. Richard, where do you think these objects are coming from, if you had to guess? If I had to guess, I, I think they're coming from another planet in another part of the universe. Not dimensional or anything like that? Well, I don't think dimensions are irrelevant. Um, you know, hey, Arthur C. Clarke said, I think, with any sufficiently advanced technology, it, it's, it, you know, indistinguishable from magic, right? Didn't he say that? And I think that, you know, where we can see that there are ways that we can manipulate space-time or that it can be manipulated – and, uh, you know, we certainly have seen behaviors of these objects that do lend uh, at least an idea toward interdimensionality. But I don't think that that's exclusive to an extraterrestrial hypothesis. I, I think they can easily go together. Um, we may develop a technology on our own one day that allows us to penetrate dimensions as well. If that's the case, then what are we looking at? Are we going to another dimension or are we are we going through another dimension to get to another part in our dimension? I, you know, I don't really know. But I, when I look at the, uh, the, the beings that are described by uh, experiencers and witnesses, they're, they have bodies. They're physical. They have arms. They have legs. Uh, they have a, a similar body plan to us. And I think that would actually speak to being uh, something that evolved in our our physical universe. I agree. That's what I think. Yeah. I agree. Thomas in La Jolla, California is with us. Hey, Tom, go ahead. Hi, George. Thank you for accepting my call. Richard, you are doing great research. Thank you very much. I have a comment and then a question. I'm throwing out a date for you. May 22, 1949, and on that day, the Secretary of Defense, who was James Forstall, mysteriously died, and um, he was mysteriously hospitalized, and then at the hospital, allegedly, he committed suicide by jumping out of a 17-story hospital window down to the hard pavement below and dying, obviously. And uh, I look at that, and at the time, nobody in Washington, D.C. believed it. I mean, James Forstall, consider, here's a guy who's at the very top of the national security food chain, he had to have known about Roswell and Aztec and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He had to know about working groups like Majestic, people like Vannevar Bush. And he had to know about the discussions about the extraterrestrial presence. But yet he mysteriously, allegedly, committed suicide on May 22, 1949, by jumping out of a hospital window. Or push, Which Thomas. Me to my question, um, was he a man who knew too much, particularly about the UFO phenomena and the extraterrestrial presence? Okay, so thank you for this question. I wrote extensively about the death of James Forrestal in my very first book over 20 years ago, and everything you say is exactly true. And uh, Forrestal, in my assessment, was murdered. You know, keep in mind, this is 14 years before the assassination of President Kennedy. And when, when Forrestal was, I think, thrown out that window, um, he, you know, the U.S. Navy said, we're taking over this investigation. And it was immediate. They closed everything down. No one questioned it. People were very trusting of the military back in those days. This is not long after World War II. Everyone was going to believe the Navy. And because he was in a naval hospital, he was at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And um, yeah, I think I, when you look at the details, there has been some very uh, good analyses that were done at the time uh, around the death of Forrestal. And it's very, very suspicious. It's it's more than suspicious. So I think he was taken out, and you are correct. Forrestal would have been 
right at the center of all of the uh, the you know it's incredible uh, new all the stress dealing with these new flying saucers that were going everywhere. There was Roswell, uh, Forrestal knew all about this, and you know it's a very interesting thing. Like what was actually happening to him? He he would become very um, some people say almost unhinged in his last few months. He had made himself an enemy with President Truman. Uh, it should be said Truman had just been reelected. And and Forrestal had kind of gotten himself on the outs with, with Harry Truman. So there was a good reason Truman wanted him out, and he, he did make Forrestal resign. But but then to have to have the man killed, that's – I mean, I don't know who was responsible for that. I, I don't think Harry Truman, but Forrestal did know things. And I, I think he was considered a security risk. I think ultimately that was the problem. He had been in uh, the, the Naval Hospital after having a kind of breakdown. Yeah, they thought he was dangerous. Be, yeah, they, they thought he was getting better, and then suddenly, boom, out the window he goes. Yeah. 16th floor to his death. Horrible. How convenient, right? Yeah. Catherine yeah. in British Columbia, west of the Rockies. Hi, Kath. Hi, good evening. Good, good to have you Richard, with us. I, Richard, I, I just, I can't get my head around this one. You said that, um, like the crash retrievals and and the bodies, you, you said they, they were like, you believe they're like bodies like us humans. And, I, and I'm, I'm wondering, do you believe that they bleed also like us humans? That's a good question. When I say they're like us humans, I think, I mean, the basic body plan. Right. Head, arms. They could be cyborgs. Legs. Who knows, right? Yeah, I, I think that there's a very good uh, artificial possibility to a lot of these creatures. That doesn't mean that they don't have natural components, but I think that they uh, – very likely, I think some of them are good candidates for being artificially constructed in one way or another through genetic modification and maybe cybernetics. Do they bleed? That's a really great question. When you go through the history of witness encounters with these beings, I don't know if I can think of a single example of someone saying, yeah, this alien was bleeding. I actually don't, I don't know of any example of that. So it was a really good question. Uh, there are cases um, in some abductee accounts of um, aliens absorbing food through their skin, but you don't really get to see blood. Right. So um, I don't know. That's a really great question. You, you have to assume if they're biological in some way, even if they're artificial. But they have blood. eyes, noses, mouths. Yeah. They, they would, they'd need some kind of internal... Uh, nutrition distribution system and blood, that's, that's what we have blood for. So I would think they have it, but do they bleed? Well, I, I don't know of any cases. I would think they would have to. We're taking calls with one, one of the world's greatest ufologists, Richard Dolan. His website is linked up at coasttocoastam.com. He's got a number of books. The last book I have for you was UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. Is that it? Well, I did a um, an, a, uh, an expansion, a new edition of that book. I, I did that book originally about ten years ago, but I wrote uh, sixty new pages to it Updated last it. winter. Before that, I did one called "The Alien Agendas," where I was speculating about uh, who these beings are and what are they all about. That was not long before that. What is your unidentified submersible objects book going to be called? Well, I I'll have that. I want that book done before the end of this year, so I'm working hard on it, and um, we'll we'll see how that goes. Okay, let's go to Bill in Los Angeles. Hey, Bill, thank you for calling. Hey, George, uh, I'm with you. Rich is up there with uh, Kevin Randall and Nick Pope on my list of he's up there guys. He sure is on this, on this topic. And uh, Rich, uh, I've talked to you a couple times uh, about uh, President Truman in particular, and I I enjoyed your your uh, perspective on that. Um, I'm a former history teacher and uh, journalist, and my perspective on the disclosure is that it's already been maxed out, and that would have occurred between 1950 and 1952. And there, there are a couple of reasons I, I'm saying that. It's not because I'm skeptical. 
Yes, because I'm being realistic, because as you just noted, in uh, right after World War II, people trusted the military and they trusted the U.S. government. Today, they do not, with very good reasons. And they also uh, they trusted the media, too. And similarly, they don't trust the media anymore for good reason. And there was limited mm-hmm. technology, relatively limited technology back then, such that no earthly aircraft were doing certainly faster than 800 miles per hour in 1952. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and today they do, you know, God knows what. And people just ascribe any kind of phenomena to some strange military uh, technology. And last, there was almost no digital technology in that period at, that could do spoofing and uh, photoshopping and that kind of stuff. And that that's added this, this uh, factor of disbelief that's really making it difficult for legit information to come along. And I think when you have President Truman coming out on camera in 1950 and saying, yeah, the Joint Chiefs of Staff talk about these flying saucers, you know, whenever, whenever we get together. I mean, I can't imagine anything like that ever happening again for, for many of the reasons I just gave. And uh, even if it did, people probably wouldn't believe it. So I think the good news is is that there's already been disclosure, and you pointed out how important the history is. And you, you said, does anybody remember the 20th century? And I certainly do, and I think that's the, the key to this. And I, I, I wish we could look forward to some great revelation, but because of these psychological factors and historical factors of technology, I don't think that's going to happen. But I think we got enough already. Thoughts, Richard? Oh, my God, man. What a great comment. I, I agree with every single thing you just said there. Uh, I just want to follow up and, and, uh, and emphasize that we, our culture today is in a much, uh, in some ways, a much more difficult position for the reasons that you state. There's no trust. Uh, we all wonder about this, whether, who, no matter who is president, because whoever's president, the other half of the country is going to hate the guy. I'm going to make a, a statement, and they'll just be like, oh, that's nonsense. I don't believe you. Uh, it, it's very difficult now. I actually agree with a lot of what you say, and then in terms of uh, getting the evidence together and uh, making it a, a making a good case for it, it's it's there's a lot of trickiness about it these days that did not exist in the 1940s and 50s. It's absolutely true. Whether that makes it impossible is another question, but I think you make very good points. Richard, what do you think of the Roswell crash story? I I think the Roswell crash is a very good case, uh, and was. Yes, something non-human, extraterrestrial. I do absolutely agree that. Um, I think we, we've had enough time, enough witnesses over the years who have been, I think, very credible uh, from a whole variety of angles, too. Not just eyewitnesses, but you've had a lot of military people. There's the uh, interview by um, Kevin Randall with Thomas DuBose, who said, yeah, that, that, that was a cover story uh, long in his retirement. And you just got a whole bunch of people when you look at all the points of evidence about Roswell. I think it's very difficult not to conclude that this was the recovery of a non-human craft with with non-human bodies. That's what I believe. And they changed the story. Didn't they come out initially and say a flying saucer had been recovered? Yeah, that's right. That came out immediately. That was out of the office of... uh, uh, General Blanchard out of Roswell Army Airfields uh, through his public re- relations um, person, Walter Hout. And that was that was pulled. And we know the story about that. We know that uh, they were ordered. Uh, you have the case of the um, guy at the radio station. It was it Frank Joyce, I think. And he said that we, we actually got a phone call from Washington saying, stop this. You are not to <laughs> transmit this story anymore. Yes. Uh, all of these things. And so that was pulled. They come up with the weather balloon story, of course, which we all know about. And uh, and that was 30 years. Uh, it took 30 years after that for the uh, the truth to come out when Stanton Friedman met Jesse Marcel. That's right. And uh, revived it all in the late 70s. I miss him, Stanton, don't you? Oh, golly. Absolutely. He was one of a kind. He was great. Steve in Albany, New York. You're up, Stephen. Go ahead. Hey, George, thanks for having me back. Thank you. I have had so many experiences that uh, you've covered tonight. Uh, It started when I was like in my crib when I was just a a toddler. Uh, I looked up, I saw three, uh, whatever you want to call them, I I think they were grays standing over me, uh, and uh, they just said, go to sleep. They gave me sentence. 
sentience. And I've been able to hang on to that for all my life. That's um, fascinating. Um, I've had experiences in my dreams. I used to be, I felt like I was being pulled out or pulled up. And then I realized that I was being abducted in my sleep. They've had, they've had me for years. Uh, but I've had three experiences. I've also been uh, abducted once. I woke up in the abduction, which I, I know that they weren't supposed to do that. And I've found myself floating over my bed. Um, I have no idea what they were doing, but, uh, I always wanted to talk to, uh, Shatner and tell him uh, what it's like to be in a transporter. Well, you've got somebody just as close as Richard Dolan. Richard, these visitations, are they primarily involuntary when they abduct? I think so. I think most of them don't. Uh, most of the folks who have these experiences don't uh, ask for them for the most part. They just happen. And when they do, we, we don't always know why, like why this person and why does this other person not have any, any such memories? Is it not happening to them, or are they, is it just they don't remember? There's a lot that we don't know about this. And uh, particularly, we're at a real disadvantage when these things do happen at night because, first of all, you've got skeptics always saying, well, you're having some kind of sleep fantasy, uh, dream state. But, but it's also possible that these other beings like to operate when we are in that state of mind. Um, a lot of possibilities in terms of human consciousness. You really have to wonder, is it easier for them to deal with us when we're in uh, cl- something closer to a sleep state? Um, you would think so. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, there's a lot of things going on here that are very difficult for us to understand. And we're, we're dealing with, you know, keep in mind, an intelligence, a group of uh, a society that is beyond us in many ways. Uh, we're not on their level, and we struggle to understand exactly how they do what they do, how they're able to manipulate us. There's a lot of cognitive manipulation going on in these experiences. That is for sure. When, when people have a, an abduction experience, I would just say um, there's always the argument, oh, you know, there's something wrong with you. You're crazy, this or that. But it's also possible that these beings, I would say likely, that they have an ability to cognitive, cognitively manipulate us, manage our memories, and uh, and have their way with us mentally. So it's very difficult to deal with them. Let's go to Kerry, first-time caller in San Juan Capistrano in California. Hello, Kerry. Thank you for calling. Hi, and thank you for taking my call. I've listened to you for a thousand years and have never called, and this is um, the first time. I'm so thankful. Okay, um, Richard, um, so my question is I saw a UFO hovering like a gold blimp in the broad daylight, driving on the 5 South, going towards San Clemente, and it was this dirt path off the side of the freeway where cars, we, and it was traffic, six traffic, 5 South, so it had to have been summertime, 1992 or 93, and Mm. plenty of cars, we pulled off into the dirt to look at this gold blimp, but it wasn't a blimp. Yeah. Um, and I think I've heard something about that later. So there is some kind of gold UFO type of thing. Sure. Did you say San Clemente? I was on my way to San Clemente, and but we pulled off on this dirt, big patch of dirt um, uh, overlooking Dana Point. Okay. And, um, and, and I was only 18 or 19, so... I didn't talk to anybody, but we were staring at this thing. It was like a movie. Uh, hindsight, of course, I, I wish I would have, you know, bumped elbows with other adults there and said, hey, what's that? What do you think? But I was so young, and I was just mesmerized and just thought it was amazing. Fascinating. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, anytime I I'll go to a, like a speak at a UFO event, I, I'll often ask, like, how many of you have seen UFOs, that type of thing? And a uh, number of hands go up, and then, and then it's yeah. always the case where I ask, Stan Friedman used to do this too, you'd ask how many of you reported it somewhere to some uh, official group like MUFON or whatever. Hands very go few, down. Very yeah. few. Exactly. And it's it's a weird thing where you get all of these witnesses, and and it's typical that like no one no one reports it, and frequently they don't even talk about it after the fact. I mean, this this is a strange, strange thing. 
uh, you're in an area or you were in an area where I think that there's a lot of uh, UFO activity that's been recorded uh, just so. And uh, the object you describe, it, I, I think, is quite fascinating. And the real question that I like to ask these days is, what are they doing? What are they doing hanging out over there? Are they are they doing this for our benefit to show us something, or are they in the middle of going from one place to another? And if so, where were they coming from? Where are they going to? They must have an infrastructure of their own, uh, a society, even if they're here visiting, even if they're here doing whatever. And I wonder about this all the time. I'm just fascinated by the question. I don't have any answers, but I think that they have a very substantial presence here that for the most part they are successful in concealing from us. Richard, what do you think of the theory of the late Zechariah Sitchin, that a group of ETs came here, seeded us because they wanted worker bees? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I I do think that there are there are oddities about our uh, development as a species. Uh, for the longest time, you know, human-like beings did exist for a very long time. And uh, the light bulb in our brain wasn't switched on, as it were. It was at a much lower level. And then we did seem to go through a very dramatic transformation. But uh, Sitchin theory, um, I'm going to be honest to say I'm not a, not a huge fan. I know that there are folks who really strongly support this notion that 400,000 or 500,000 years ago, they took human beings and worked them um, to get gold and, and this type of thing. My, my issue with it is the ability of the ancient Sumerians, who lived about 6,000 years ago, accurately to record this type of information on their tablets. And I'm, I'm just not quite sure about it. But I do, I do, I'm very open to the idea that we have been observed for a very long time. I think that's quite, quite possible and probably likely. And figuring out the details is still tricky. Sitchin's work is interesting, but, uh, you know, keeping in mind, too, when he wrote back in the 1970s and 80s, our understanding of paleoanthropology was very, very low compared with where uh, that field has gone in the last 20, 30 years. So I'm, I'm just not sure I, what I think about Sitchin. Let's go to Bob in Indiana, east of the Rockies. Hey, Robert, go ahead. Hi, George. Thank you. Sure thing. Uh, Richard, I met you at your first and my only UFO conference in Lachlan a long time ago. In 2001. Uh, yeah. Uh, I How have bought both of your UFOs in the National Security State books and read them two or three times. But since then, I've lost my vision, and I've been able to get the Volume 1 on Audible. Is there any chance you'll put Volume 2 on Audible? Yes, absolutely. I'm working on it right now. In fact, I'm doing a whole Audible audiobook uh, project that's going on. The, the second volume is the toughest because it's such a big, fat book. But uh, I am, am assuring you it is, it's going to happen. That's intense doing the audio, audiobooks, Richard. Oh, my God. Well, I, I've only read one of them, and it's, it's about to come out. <laughs> so I did the audio reading of UFOs for the 21st century mind, and where I have a sound engineer who's just making it really nice. But that's great. It's a lot of work. I have readers for for most of the other ones, and uh, we'll see how Volume Two of National Security State goes. It's it's a lot of work. Let's go to George in St. Louis. It's almost like I'm talking to myself. Hi, George. Hi, George. Um, yeah. Good morning. I I got a proposal. Uh, I believe, and we, you talked about interdimensional travel. I believe what, what we're experiencing is our future. Even even the Big Bang, that's our future. That from the perspective of these visitors, they're visiting the past. But, excuse me, the past. But what we're experiencing is our future from, you know, from our perspective. Time traveling. So, exactly. So that's what I think we're experiencing. Uh, visitors from their perspective, going into the past, but from our perspective, that's our future. What do you think of that, Rich? Yeah, I wonder about uh, the time travel theory. I, I'll say this. I think that, in a sense, this is true, that we, I don't know if I like this, but I think our society and our trajectory is making us increasingly like 
aliens that are coming here. In other words, a highly integrated, digitally controlled, almost hive mind type of a thing. I really do wonder if that's what our future is going to be. Are we going to become like them? But are they exactly time travelers or not? Uh, my jury is out on that. I don't really know how to uh, understand how time travel could work without screwing up all the timelines, you know. So it's not, it's not clear to me how, how I'm going to accept that one. Let's go uh, west, I'm open to it. west of the Rockies. Pamela's with us in Simi Valley, California. Hey, Pam, go ahead. Hi, George and Richard. Hi. Um, I have a question. I was thinking about, do you suppose our government has been hiding the UFOs from us because they have come to help us get rid of diseases? My take on the origins of the secrecy is uh, like clear-cut national security. It's like this stuff came down, we acquired some very advanced technology, and we do not want to share this with the Russians or anyone else who you know might compete with us. That, that's what I really believe happened, and it was uh, absolute highest-level priority. Uh, as far as evidence for aliens coming to help us uh, cure diseases, you know, I'd like to. I need to find evidence that's really going to persuade me that they are here for that purpose. Uh, I haven't seen it, but if we come across it, I'll. I guess I'll change my opinion. Next up, we've got Bill in Dallas, Texas. Hey, Bill, go ahead, sir. Hello, George. How you doing? Good, How you Bill. Doing Dallas. Well, that is up to Tommy, but uh, that's not a bad spot. All right, uh, Richard. I'd like to know what you think about. Uh, the purpose behind the alien implants. Uh, they've told uh, George through uh, guest comments that uh, it's upgrading human beings, upgrading us into what, cyborgs, or what is what is that about? I remember yeah. the late Roger well, Lear. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I think, I think uh, they may serve a variety of purposes. One might be monitoring uh, our even psychological state, mental state, I think is a definite possibility. Uh, tracking device, that type of thing, for sure. In terms of upgrading us, yeah, it's a possibility, I suppose. I uh, we're speculating here, but th there's definitely a uh, a desire. I think, at least in, when you look at the hybrid phenomenon, for them to either create a new form of human, a hybrid human that will allow them to be here. I think that's a definite possibility. So I think there's a good chance that they're modifying themselves so that maybe they can live here. If they, could, if they come from another planet, they're not going to be initially suitable to live here. There's solar radiation is different, gravity is different, all these bacteria are different. So they would need to be compatible with Earth's ecosystem to begin with, and that would require them to hybridize and to become maybe like us, like the leading – species on the planet, human beings, and fit in? Is that a possibility? Are they upgrading us? Upgrading is a really loaded word. Does that mean they're making us better? <laughs> I don't know. Or are they just changing us? We are definitely changing. I think the human species is going through very significant uh, evolution. Evolution doesn't stop, and I think we're going through a, a, a speeding up of it, to be honest, uh, whether that's being caused by them or by the transformation of our own society is another question. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.